changes that have been happening. Yeah. Hopefully it hasn't happened in your area, okay? But it, it happened in our house. Uh, it started yesterday at about uh, 1.30ish. And, uh, and we still don't have our power back. And it's only been a little over 24 hours, right? But because we're so used to the light, it seems like forever. It's like things that we're so that we take for granted, you know, like yeah. the ability to to see, uh, to yeah. be able to open and see like what clothes you're gonna wear, or like, you know. And it just seems like um, it's funny because we we were lighting up all the candles in the house, and all of a sudden Fernando was was grateful for all of the candles <laughs> that that I bought that he thought we never would need because he's like. Why do we have so many candles? Because of times like these, right? <laughs> so um, pray for the power to come back. So tonight, we're going to talk about the importance of seeing clearly. The importance of seeing clearly, okay? Um, the title of my lesson is The God Who Sees Me. The God Who Sees Me. So uh, today is the last Women's Midweek of the month in uh, Women's History Month, which is March. So I thought we could look um, at a woman in the Bible, okay? So we're going to look into the story of Hagar, and we're gonna touch on Abram and Sarai, whose names are changed later on. You guys might know them more as Abraham and Sarah. Okay, so let's turn to Genesis 16. And now where, where most of our, most of our, our uh, lesson for tonight is going to come from. So Genesis 16. So many of you guys have heard the story of Abram and Sarai. Um, you know, Sarai, she, uh, she hasn't been blessed with a son yet. The son that she had been promised by God. So she becomes uh, frustrated and desperate, and then she sees Hagar, Hagar, her slave, and she tells her husband, Abram, in verse 2, we can read there, it says, The Lord has kept me from having children. Go sleep with my slave. Perhaps I can build a family through her. And Abram doesn't seem to fight this idea <laughs> at all. Okay? He's like, okay. And let's see what happens, okay? So my first my first point is see the true refuge we have. See the true refuge we have. Okay? So let's keep reading in uh, verse five. Let's go, Jackie. Uh, it says, he slept with Hagar. And she conceived. When she knew she was pregnant, she began to despise her mistress. Then Sarai said to, said to Abram, you are responsible for the wrong I am suffering. I put my slave in your arms. And now that she knows she's pregnant, she despises me. May the Lord judge between you and me. Your slave is in your hands, Abram said. Do with her whatever you think best. Then Sarai mistreated Hagar, so she fled from her. The angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert. So I want us to put ourselves in Hagar's shoes, okay? Let's try to connect with how she's feeling. So she's an Egyptian. Historians believe that Hagar uh, was a, da a daughter of Pharaoh and uh, that she had been given to Abram as an offering during one of uh, Abram's trips to Egypt, okay? So try to imagine just how she's feeling, how isolated Hagar must have felt in the middle of a place and a culture that's completely different than hers, okay? Also just the rejection that she must have experienced as a slave. And now she's basically used as a surrogate, like a concubine, right? And it doesn't seem like she had a say in this. Like she could really say, no, I don't want to do this right. because she has no rights. She's a slave. So this is a situation. She's pregnant. She's a slave. And she begins to despise Sarai. Sarai, we see, gets upset at her husband, even though it was her idea in the first place. Have you been there? Like, you just, it's like, oh, I'm mad. I know it's. I did this, but I'm still angry. It's still your fault. And Sarai, she basically got what she wanted. You know, and when 
when our emotions, our emotions outpace our faith, Whoa. we make moves that we later regret. Yeah. When we let our emotions outpace our faith, okay, wow. then things like this happen. We regret things. An Ishmael, which we'll read soon, happens in our life. Wow. And it doesn't have to necessarily be a child. An Ishmael can be anything that happens to come about from a decision that you made without faith. Okay? So, uh, what Sarah did had very lasting effects in her life. What is your response when God is having you wait? Or what is your response when God says no? Or not yet? Or when you're in a challenging situation like Hagar was? What is your response? Do you try to take matters into your own hands? Do you try to help God out? <laughs> And we see that Hagar is also in this place of desperation. So what does Hagar do? She decides to run. She decides to flee and she ends up where? Not in the promised land. She ends up in the desert. And uh, you know those high winds that we had yesterday? Yeah. I thought my five-year-old was, my five-year-old BB was going to fly away to outer space. So that's the type of wind, that's the type of wind that was constant in this desert where Hagar was going. It was a strong, constant wind that you could barely walk through it. And it's interesting that the meaning of Hagar's name in Hebrew is to flee. And this makes me think that this may not have been the first time that Hagar fled. It could have been something that was a pattern in her life that she that she did frequently because it was a part of her name. It was a part of her identity. So Hagar was fleeing from where God had her. And uh, tonight I want to ask you, is there anything that you might be fleeing from? Is there something that you may be fighting God on? Because Hagar was basically headed back to her Egypt. We have our Egypt, right? Our past life. And um, she was headed back to what's familiar. And this is what a lot of us tend to do. When, when we start getting weak spiritually, we start to going back to what's familiar, to our Egypt, right? She was headed back to a place where they worshipped many gods. They didn't worship the one true God. They worshipped many gods. And if you are not careful, that can be you. Right. Wow. Come on, Jackie. Let's turn to Proverbs 14. Let's turn to Proverbs 14. Okay. Proverbs 14, verse 12. I may be reading from a different translation than yours, and that's why it's going to sound different. But Proverbs 14, verse 12. Come on, Jackie. It says, there's a path before each person that seems right but in the end it leads to death you see it may seem like our way it just makes sense like this makes sense what god has me in it does not make any sense my way makes sense but in the end it will create more trouble for you the scripture says it leads to death. Right. And this is where Hagar is at. She's fleeing in search of a refuge, something that's going to make her feel better. Right. right? What is a refuge? A refuge is a place or a thing that you go to in search of safety and protection. Yeah. Some place where you go to get help or you get relief or you get healing or a place where you want to escape too, right? Yeah. Yeah. Where we go, where where do you go? Because where we go for our refuge will shape your identity. Yeah. Okay? So when you're insecure, where do you go? When you're feeling fearful, where do you run to? When you feel pressure, what do you reach for? Wow. What is your refuge? Because all of us here today, we have a refuge. Okay? But it just may not be the right one. Yeah. Because we see that Hagar, 
she may have gotten rid of her immediate challenge, which was the mistreatment by Sarai, right? But she was still not at peace in her life, even though she had left that. You see that. Maybe in the middle of running from a situation, you may feel like, yes, I got away from this situation. But it doesn't mean that you're in the right place. Sometimes, sometimes you'll find that we need certain situations sent by God to help us understand the reality of how much we actually need God. Yes. Come on, right? And to see that he is the one true uh, refuge in our life. You know, um, we need to see that a boy is not a refuge. Oh, I the interest. The interest. That's not a refuge. You know, not, not, a, not a position. Don't go out there. Don't go after the role. Are you a real Christian? You don't need the title, right? Not a job. That can't be your refuge. Our refuge has to be God and nothing else. And I want to just share a little bit a little bit about my story because I know that some of you guys haven't heard. I, wa- I want you to know me. I want to hear you. <laughs> right? Some of you guys were even converted after we after we left. We left to DFW in, in 2020. Yeah. So um, you know, I'm an only child. Okay. That might make a lot of sense. <laughs> but I'm an only I'm an only child. I was born and raised in Los Angeles, California. And uh, I'm a Guatemalan descent. <laughs> nationality. Um, so my mom, she was a single mother and uh, hardworking. She sometimes had three to five different jobs at a time. So I, I hardly saw my mom, you know, I'd come home. What do you call a latchkey child? Because she was working a lot. And um, every year growing up, my mom and I, we would travel to Guatemala and um, during the summer break from our school. And while we were in Guatemala, my mom and I, we would visit her brother, okay? And I really loved my uncle. Like, he was the youngest one of all of their siblings. There were seven, I believe, and he was the youngest. He was funny. He was so bright. But he was in prison for murder. And this was confusing to me, you know? I'm like, what? Is this? He's so, like, why are we going to see him here? He's so, he's such a great person. Um, that's how I saw it at my age, but um, he was there because he said that he had taken prescription drugs and had mixed it with other substances. His refuge was drugs and alcohol. So um, he said that he lost control and he killed his mom. So that makes me he killed my grandma. He, he basically killed my mom's mom. And not everyone forgave him, but my mom quickly forgave him, you know, and so one day, um, you know, we decided to visit him, and we would bring his favorite food, and we would bring a blanket so that we can have a picnic with him, and, but we didn't know that when we were visiting him that day that they were going to hold all the visitors hostage that day. And I knew it was a bad day to visit as soon as I got there when I saw the look of terror in his eyes when he said, you guys shouldn't be here. Because he had double, triple checked that we were not going to go. But we wanted to surprise him. And when we were there, shortly after we got there, we just, you know, hear a mob of people running and shooting up and yelling. And my eight, nine-year-old mind uh, couldn't really comprehend the gravity of what was happening until I saw my mom cry. Mm. And all the other moms, you know, begging, like, do whatever you want with us, but just let the children go. Mm. But they didn't listen, and they kept shooting, and people ran and used each other as human shields from the, from the bullets flying everywhere, um, you know, to keep them from, getting, from themselves getting, getting wounded. So we're in this prison in a third world country, in Guatemala, against our will, with rats crawling over us at night as we slept. And I'm thinking, for sure someone is going to come and rescue us. Like, why wouldn't they come, you know? And it's like, don't worry, Mom, they'll come. I kept telling my mom as she cried at night. And we waited hours, and hours became days. And we were held hostage for seven days until finally we were released. And even though I came out of the situation in Guatemala, and I was back in the U.S., in my little safe school, I still found myself in the wrong place. I was still 
held hostage in my mind. You know, I had PTSD. Uh, you know, I was deeply afraid of everything. So as the years went on and I was older, I still found myself fleeing and running, you know, and trying to find a refuge, trying to find places where I could forget and I could escape my reality. So the truth is, the truth is that a lot of us have this tendency to want to escape yeah. and to flee. Yeah. You know, like Hagar, we we run from rejection mm -hmm. and we take refuge in bitterness and hate. Wow. Or we run from pressure, like this is too hard, I can't do this anymore. <laughs> but then we take pressure we take refuge in our impurity. Mm -hmm. Or in, in overindulgence, like in, yeah. oh let me just over let me buy something. Right. That's gonna make me feel better, right? right? Or in overeating. Yeah. Or we run from situations that are that are too hard and we take refuge in, in weed or in alcohol or in uh, sexual immorality or just plain idleness or laziness. Right. We run we can run from past hurts. Maybe you weren't held hostage, but maybe you've been through like some difficult situations, abuse, yeah. uh, you know, violence in your past life and and we can run from past hurt, but then we take refuge in discouragement and sadness. Wow. And uh, we run when some something doesn't go the way that we planned. Maybe you had dreams of something happening and you're like, it's not happening. But then what happens is that you can take refuge in your ingratitude for the things that you currently do have. Wow. Wow. So, so practically, okay, I want you to put a name to your refuge. If it's God, amen. <laughs> Continue to run to him. Amen. But if it's not, put a name to it. Put a name to, to what you may be running to. Is it discouragement? Do you find yourself getting discouraged often? Is it bitterness? Do you find yourself running to bitterness or criticalness? Do you quickly just get critical towards someone? Wow. Like, why are they acting like this? Or is it contempt, considering someone undeserving of your respect? This is what Hagar did with Sarai. As soon as she got pregnant, she was contemptuous towards Sarai. Wow. She's like, now I have something that you don't. Wow. Is that your refuge? Do you quickly run to contempt? So look for scriptures. When you put a name to your refuge, look for scriptures on that. Or ask your discipler or your mentor, for help on finding some scriptures and make the decision to repent and make God your refuge and run to him. Okay? So point number two, point number two, um, let's go back to chapter uh, 16 in Genesis. Point number two is see who God is and how he sees you. See who God is and how he sees you. So Genesis um, chapter 16, and we're gonna keep reading in verse seven. Come on, Jackie. Come on, Jackie. Okay, it says, the angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert. It was a spring that is beside the, ro the road to Shur. And he said, Hagar, slave of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? I'm running away from my mistress, Sarai, she answered. Then the angel of the Lord told her, go back to your mistress and submit to her. The angel added, I will increase your descendants so much that they will be too numerous to count. The angel of the Lord also said to her, you are now pregnant and you will give birth to a son. You shall name him Ishmael, for the Lord has heard your misery. He will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone and everyone's hand against him. And he will live in hostility toward, toward all his brothers. She gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees me. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. Wow. And I love this part. Yeah. <laughs> right? God sends the angel of the Lord. It says, he found her. Right. Found her. Not simply appeared to her wow. or showed up. Mm -hmm. Poof. True. The word found, what does it imply? Yes. It implies a searching, wow. a looking for, maybe yeah. something that's lost. Wow. Hagar is 
found by God in the desert, in the middle of nowhere. Remember, we're talking more than just being noticed or acknowledged. Okay? We're talking more than that here. It's one thing to say, I see you playing hide and seek. No, no, no. But it's another thing for God to say, I've been looking for you. I've been searching for you, and I see you. And nowadays, people see you on social media, right? And um, But they're just noticing you. They don't really know you. They're just That's noticing true. you. A well, glance. Jackie, a um, glance, right? Yeah. I said scroll past our post and our pictures for entertainment. Right. Wow. They're so different than God. Yeah. Right? Yeah. God sees you. He stays. He yeah. abides. He yeah. cares. Yeah. It's so different than what we see nowadays. People yeah. seeing you, right? Yeah. Yeah. God's pursuit of Hagar was a search in order to be known. Wow. It's deep. And we hear this in the way that God addresses her. The first word that comes out of God's mouth is Hagar. It's her name. She's called by her name for the first time in this text. If you notice, Abram and Sarai wouldn't even call her by her name. They would call her this slave, my slave girl, this, like if she's a thing, right? But not God. He treated her like his daughter. And not a slave. Wow. Come on, Jackie. And that's how he saw her. He saw her. And and it says, it got me thinking because in verse 8 it says, um, where have you come from? He asks, where have you come from? And where are you going? This is incredible. God takes a moment to ask her about her life. And God, of course, already knows the answers to these questions, right? But he asks anyways. And we see the same thing modeled in the life of Jesus, right? You guys see Jesus asking questions all the time. He's probing people with questions. He's like, what do you want me to do for you? Do you want to be healed? You know, who are you looking for? Because isn't there power in voicing your victories? Isn't there power in voicing you know, the things that you're going through, your experiences, oh, yeah. and your suffering, yeah. mm-hmm. right? When you voice these things, it's like it helps you to feel seen and valued. Yeah, mm-hmm. so true. But are you voicing them to God or just to people? Mm-hmm. Are you voicing these things to God? Wow. Or is your first, the first person that you go to, like your mentor, your disciple, your husband, this is what's going on, Come on. Or are you going to God? All of us can be like Hagar. Every one of us. God asks us the same question. Where have you come from? And where are you going? Why? Why does he do this? Why does God do this? Because God knows that in our desert, without vision, we will die. We will perish. He knows knows what his vision for our lives is, but he wants us us to know right 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 he knew that hagar would die in the desert Mm. if she kept going aimlessly she would die think about it pray about it okay what are the thing the three things okay come up with three things if you have it that you would like to accomplish in the year of miracles i know that this isn't the beginning of the year but a lot of the things that maybe you thought about in the beginning of the year maybe you lost track of already Mm, right so it's okay we can start again now (laughs) right think of three things you would like to accomplish in the year of miracles okay but don't tell me to get married don't tell me that's one of the ones oh i want to get married no don't let that be one that's not up to you (laughs) that's not up to you okay a vision a vision that maybe kind of scares you, okay, a little bit. A mission team, perhaps. Uh, the, you know, maybe discipling someone or more people than you are already discipling. Or leading a certain Bible study. Or leading a Bible talk. A, a campus group, you know, leading a region, leading a church. Maybe working on your Spanish to help our Spanish Like, I want to make the decision to 
spend more quality time with some of my kids to get them to become disciples. Right? Make those decisions. Maybe they scare you a little bit, but go after that. So let's go back to verse 13. And let's reread that. It says, you are the God who sees me. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. And this is so powerful. When I read this, I thought, what made her change her course? Okay, like from going from fleeing from God to going back to doing what God wanted her to do. Because it was hard. If you think about it, like what made her go back to Sarai to that difficult decision? Okay, it's actually pretty simple. But yet it's profound, okay? This is what I what I found. She realized something. Okay. She realized God sees me. Wow. Wow. Because she realized that he saw her, she finally now saw him. Wow. And it was like she realized, God, you rescued me. Like I'm no longer rejected. I will no longer have, I have, I'm not going to fear anymore. Yeah. You see me, you know, like she, she, she had new convictions. Yeah. God loves me. Yeah. He values me yeah. wow. and he sees me wow. like I'm not a slave. Yeah. And sometimes we fight so hard to be seen by people, yeah. to find our protection in wow. people. To be loved by people, to be accepted by people, to be rescued by people. We can do things and just wait for others to see how hard we worked. You know, I grew up feeling rejected and I saw myself, you know, a certain way. I felt rejected by my dad. Um, and this led me to cope with, with this emptiness in wrong ways. You know, um, Growing up, I, I used to um, I used to want to be seen by people. I wanted to. That was part of it, you know. And you know, I was a cheerleader. I would run track. You know, had people cheer cheer me on as I ran. And you know, being a part of drumline to be seen. I was president of my school. I was class clown in yearbook. <laughs> homecoming court you know and and I was drawn to these things because I wanted to be seen so badly you know and um and but the, the problem is that I was running towards things that didn't really fulfill right they don't really last very long am I still doing that no <laughs> you know I'm not like it's I I can't I can't do this once anymore <laughs> And I tried to fulfill a need that only God could fill. Wow. Yeah. And and now I can struggle sometimes. You know, I'm, I've shared this before. I'm married to an awesome, powerful man of God. Yeah. And, if, and if I'm not careful, I can feel unseen. Mm-hmm. You know? But at the end of the day, on a daily basis, the reason why I can pivot to do what God has called me to do, even the hard and the difficult things, you know, that sometimes don't make sense Mm -hmm. it's because i choose to do what is right for god Mm -hmm. like i I, because i know i have that conviction that i am now seen by god i don't need to be seen by people come on jackie you know and it's him who i desire to please because i know that i'm loved and seen by him so here we see that she's given a new opportunity by god okay to go back and do what is right She's basically giving her a second chance. Like, Hagar, I know that you got contemptuous. I know that you became prideful. Uh But go back, you know. So she goes back. And uh, let's see here. She she calls. She says, uh, you're going to have a son. The angel of the Lord says, you're going to have a son. Name him Ishmael, which means God hears. So that every time that she calls out her son's name, she was reminded that God hears her. And she also gives her a promise that her son will be like a wild donkey of a man. And you think, 
what? Like, that sounds so bad. I don't want my son to be a, a wild donkey of a man. Right? It sounds bad. But it actually meant that her son would not be enslaved, that he wouldn't be contained wow. like she was. Wow. This was encouraging to her. This was encouraging to her. She didn't want her son to end up being a slave like she was. And this should also be encouraging to us to know that when we decide to do even the hard things for God, that the, the people around us, including our children, could have the opportunity to be different. Wow. You know, it can change the course. It can change the course of not just our lives, but the people around us. You know, breaking the cycle. Isn't that amazing? God gives us the opportunity to pivot, to pivot our future and the future of others. Wow. So we find that Hagar finally saw God and her perspective completely changes, right? What is your perspective on who God is? What would you name God today? Because she had the audacity to name God. She's the only person, she's the only person in the Bible who names God. Wow. Okay, so what would you name God today? The God who loves or the God who disappoints? Wow. The God who restores or the God who is distant? Let's turn to John 10.10. 10. It says, uh, John 10.10, 10, it says, The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. So let's see, who is God? Who is Jesus? What is our perspective about God? Here in the scripture, Jesus is saying, I'm not a thief. Would you say... Uh, the God who is a thief. The God who is inconsistent. No, right? Jesus says, I'm not a thief. Right. A burglar's basic aim is to break into your house and find something of great value, right? Yeah. A thief wouldn't come into your house and take the bath mat and your toothbrush. <laughs> I hope not, right? He would come into your house and he would try to steal something that's expensive. It, something yeah. that's precious yeah. and some of us at first we totally understood this like we were like the God who sees me the God who loves me the God of you know the yeah. God who loves me so much but then little by little it does become a little blurry yeah. Yeah. and sometimes it doesn't happen really quick right yeah. it can take time it can even take years yeah but for some it could be really fast like with jesus as, as soon as he got baptized by john the baptist what happened the enemy quickly got in there yeah. to try to to you know distract him from yeah. god yeah and Come that's on. what can happen with us and that's why after our baptism you cannot lose momentum yeah. in your relationship with god because yeah. satan, satan on, wants man. to steal your relationship with god yeah. Yeah. So we see, um, you know, sometimes we forget who Jesus really is. Yeah. He's not coming to rob. He's coming to give. Yeah, wow. This is what Jesus is. He's not a thief. Yeah. The Bible says that he actually stands at the door and actually knocks. Wow. And he waits for you to invite him, for you to open the door. Yeah. Right? That's what it says. Come on, Jackie. And sometimes we don't have that perspective on him. Yeah. Wow. So then he comes into the house and he starts putting precious things in our house. Wow. He starts setting things on the mantle. He starts wow. sweeping up the place. Wow. He starts dusting off the shelves. Wow. And he fills up your life with everything that's worth living wow. for, right? Wow. With purpose, with fulfillment, wow. with meaning, with true love, with peace, with confidence, security, and even freedom. Do you believe this? Or are you yeah, sitting yeah. there being like, that's not happening with me? Oh. <laughs> oh. Wow. Come on, Jackie. Right? Let's keep it real. 
A lot of people don't understand this about Jesus. Do you understand this about Jesus? Or have you forgotten it? Some people, they fear, you know, that he wants to break into their lives and rob them of freedom. Right? This is what my mom, uh, my mom didn't want me to become a disciple. This is like, you know, in 1999. <laughs> a long time ago. She's like, you're going to, you're going to lose yourself. I'm like, yep, thank God. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm no longer going to be that captive little girl abused and held hostage. No, that's not going to be my identity. She said, she said, you're going to be boring. I'm like, I'm not boring. I'm not boring. <laughs> I'm not boring. <laughs> right? So people, people suspect this, that he wants to take away your fulfillment. Wow. He wants to put an end to your adventure. Wow. No, so are you going true. on adventures with God? Yeah. Are you going on adventures with God? Yeah. You know, I've heard God wants greater control of my life, and I don't want to let him. I'm fighting him. And you know what? If you're doing that, you're going to win. You're going to win. You can keep God out. You can slam the door. You can put bars up in your windows and close your mind and your heart. If you want to do that, you can stop him. He's not forcing you. But if you do, you have not really seen God. You don't understand who God really is. That he will actually fill your house with everything that you can possibly need. Everything that you're probably going to run to the store and the marketplace to try to find. And it's going to be so costly. You know, like impurity, fits of rage. You know how... Fits of rage got me in so much trouble when I was young. Mm. Fits of rage, envy, immorality, all of these things are so costly and they're things that completely destroy. It's going to cost you. You want to shut him out? You can. But it's going to cost you. We need to understand that God is providing us with what we need. So how do we do this? How do we really see God? Let's turn to James uh, chapter 1, verse 22. James chapter 1, verse 22. And I'm going to read from the NLT version. It says, it says, but don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you are only fooling yourself. What if Hagar would have been like, I see you, God, but kept walking to Egypt? <laughs> what if she still decided sometimes to worship? Like, every now and then, I'll still worship my past gods. You won't really see God if you're going to, to your past life in Egypt. This is for all of you guys. If you're living a double life, if you're still smoking weed or drinking every now and then, it's going to come out, guys. God, God exposes it. He, he wants that to be out of your life. If you're cursing here and there, even in your mind, if you're not doing what God's word says, if you're still not submitting to your husband, that's, a, that's actually what God told Hagar to do, to go and submit. Yeah. That's, you know, submission. Mm-hmm. Are you submitting? Not only when he's perfect, <laughs> but because your father is perfect. Yeah. I challenge you to go after it, you know, in your quiet time. Add, you know, not just read or hear the, the word, but practically. Like, leave your quiet times with practicals for the day. Yeah. You know, like, challenges. How can I practically put this into practice today? Yeah. Because if we're not putting it into practice, the, the scripture in James it says that we're only fooling ourselves. Yeah. Right? So let's read God's word and put it into practice. Let's see who God is and how he sees you. Okay, my last point. Point number three. All right, Jackie. Okay, see others through God's eyes. See others through God's eyes. Okay. How do you see God? reflects a lot on how you see the world. Yeah. Let's turn to Mark 8. All right. 
Verse 22. Mark 8, verse 22. Mark 8, verse 22. It says, Then he came to Bethsaida, and they brought a blind man to him, and begged him to touch him. So he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the town. And when he had spit on his eyes and put his hands on him, he asked him if he saw anything. And he looked up and said, I see men like trees walking. Then he put his hands on his eyes again and made him look up. And he was restored and saw everyone clearly. A lot of us are familiar with the scripture. You know, Jesus helps this man to see again. And at last, he could see people clearly without distortion, okay? And I, I know this scripture has a deeper meaning, amen? But it speaks to me when it says, I see men, but they look like trees walking. Yeah. And that can be our problem sometimes. We don't see people very clearly. Wow. They become just a part of the landscape in our lives. Yeah. Wow. They're about as important as trees. Wow. Versus seeing them as precious souls. Wow. We think they're they're actually meant for us to just, you know how you look at the trees? Oh, that's so pretty. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so nice. <laughs> you know, and we, we begin to see them as like they're meant for us to meet our needs. Wow. Like tools to make us happy. Wow. Mm. And we can forget to see people the way that God sees them. Yeah, wow. We forget to run up to them the way that someone ran up to us to share right. their faith with us. Wow, yeah. Come on, Jackie. And we need to think, wow, like she is the object of God's greatest affection. That's, mm-hmm. that's awesome. Like yeah. Jesus died on the cross. He shed his blood on the cross for her. Yeah. God searches day and night that's so true. for her right. to have a relationship wow. Wow. with her. That's right. Wow. And this is how we must think, or else we'll see them just like trees wow. walking. You know, when, when I was a baby Christian, it was tough for me to share my faith because I was so concerned about how people could respond. I thought, what if they say no? Uh, yeah, there's going to be a lot to say no. <laughs> what if they persecute me? Yeah, they're, they're going to persecute me. Um, and so I knew I needed to do something radical. And I don't remember if my disciple challenged me on this or not. I tried to think about that, but I don't remember. But I, I was just like, I need to do something radical. Mm-hmm. Something that scared me, right? Yeah. Something that was for God that pushed me to not care about what other people thought about me. Mm-hmm. So I asked my teacher at the end of class if I could make an, an announcement to the class. And, and I'm, I'm not, like, afraid of public speaking, yeah. but I remember when I went up there, I was shaking, and I was like, <laughs> and my, my voice was trembling, and I was like, <laughs> and I, I get up, and I'm like, it's, you know, it's Women's Day Month, I mean, it's Women's History Month, and I'm inviting the whole, uh, you know, the women in the class, if they want to come to Women's Day, and it was the month of March, so I'm up there inviting people. And mind you, everyone, um, most people in the school, they knew us as the disciples on campus. So um, after I finished, one by one, they began to walk out. And it was like this, you know? Mm-hmm. And they just kept walking out. <laughs> and I'm like, this is so good for me. Oh my God. <laughs> like if I was invisible. Wow. And it was good because it was it was killing the homecoming queen mentality. Right? <laughs> it was killing the cheerleader. It was killing the track girl. You know, the ASB president. You know, the one that cared so much about what people thought about her. One by one, people didn't see her. They didn't care who she was. They didn't care how she looked. I needed to be seen by God. And when everyone left, one girl walked walked up to me. I was like, thank you, God. (laughs) But it was still at the end. And she walked up to me, and she's like, oh, I can have a flyer. I I 
and maybe interested in coming. And then, and then um, she came out to Women's Day, wow. and she studied the Bible, and she got baptized. Yes. <laughs> sees you. You yeah. don't have to be a slave. You are God's daughter. See others how God sees them. Precious souls you've been called to save. Wow. Remember, we are loved and seen by God. Love you all. To God be the Jackie. Jackie.